Hello, I'm Susanna Weymouth, and I'm your host for today's Tampa Bay Community Network's Culture Ventures. We have a very special show for you today with our guest, Mark Cantrell, President and CEO of the Florida Orchestra. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. So, Mark, you have had a very interesting career. You started off as a professional musician. Tell us a little bit about your time there. So, I uh, grew up in Arizona. I uh, realized very quickly that uh, Arizona back in the 1980s was not a cultural bastion that I would have liked it to have been, especially for classical music. So I uh, went back east to school at Boston University and was very fortunate to start playing professionally right out of college. And I started playing with the Boston Pops, also played with the ballet and the opera, and uh, did a lot of recording. It was a, a great way to start, and I didn't have to do the... Um, starving musician thing that many of my uh, friends and colleagues had to do for years, waiting tables or doing whatever uh, as we started. I had about three months of that in between college and when I started playing, uh, which is great. I mean, I actually applied for a job at Taco Bell and was turned down because I was not career oriented is what they told me. Three months later, I started playing. I got hired by uh, John Williams with the Boston Pops and started playing with them and it was a great career. Loved it, every minute of it. That's the iconic and legendary John Williams who's about to, I think, celebrate his 90th birthday. He just did. I was uh, uh, out at Tanglewood. My wife and I were out at Tanglewood just uh, last week or two weekends ago uh, for his, his uh, entire weekend celebration with Yo-Yo Ma and uh, uh, Isak Perlman and uh, you know a whole variety of people. It was a really, really nice, nice celebration. And that leads us right into Isak Perlman, who is being welcomed as one of the many featured artists for what is a very, very special, important season for the Florida Orchestra. The Florida Orchestra is in its 55th season. That's five and a half decades of leadership as an arts organization. I believe it's the largest professional orchestra in the state of Florida and the largest performing arts organization in Tampa Bay. Mark, you joined about three years ago and you've had many successes since then and many challenges. I know that COVID's in the rear view <laughs> mirror, uh, but you also just did in record time, I understand, uh, negotiate the new collective bargaining agreement for the musicians. Yep, our CBA, we concluded that in six sessions, six days. My goodness, so yeah. that is record time. Uh, yeah, I've been part of many negotiations on both sides of the tables as a musician and as a manager. And this one went incredibly easy. We have really what I would say is one of the best group of musicians uh, in the planet. You know, having been one, uh, I, I might be a little bit of a homer and a little bit biased, but they, uh, they really are a great group of people. And uh, we just never stopped talking since I've been here, you know, three and a half years ago in February when I showed up. Um, you know, we sat down with the musicians and we've always had an open dialogue going so we didn't have to spend, you know, a couple of weeks trying to figure out just how to communicate with each other and talk. We could be uh, very frank and knew what we were doing and the process was incredibly smooth. Their attorney was fantastic, also a former musician uh, who decided to go into uh, labor law. So it really was a great process and, and very, uh, a process that also wasn't just get a great contract out there, but it also was uh, allowed the orchestra uh, to grow both collectively with the musicians and also within our community. Wonderful. Well, that's a big success, and I understand that the board of directors is extremely pleased with you because I believe that they just extended your contract for six years. Those poor guys, I don't know if they knew what they were getting into. But so yes. that's big stability for yeah. the orchestra, Mark, uh, and you've built, obviously, a good foundation. You've made it through the headwinds of all of the past uh, couple of years, not just COVID, but the economic downturn, stock market difficulties and uncertainties. And so here you are, poised for the future, five and a half decades. What is the future for the Florida Orchestra? How do you see it? Well, the future of the Florida Orchestra is what I've been talking about for the last several years. We are, um, we are here to build what we call a 21st century orchestra. The uh, New York Philharmonics, the Boston Symphonies, uh, Chicago, Cleveland, all those big orchestras were all started to develop who they were and their identity about 100 years ago in the 20s and the 30s, and then certainly through the 40s, of defining really what we've come to know as the, as the 20th century orchestra. And uh, times change. You know, technology changes, the world changes, people's uh, appetites change. You have to realize 100 years ago in 1922, if you wanted to go hear music, you went to a venue to hear music. Um, so it's very different than what we have today. And the 21st century orchestra is gonna be the orchestra that defines how we interact and intersect with our community and how we build community. Our first job is no longer just to preserve great music. Our first job is to play 
uh, or, or to, to build community and to provide more than just entertainment for our people. And if, if our goal and every thought that we have is not in uh, how we make this a better place for the people that live here, for everyone, uh, then we need to rethink about why we're in business. And that's why it's so exciting being here with a, a great board, fantastic musicians, and of course a wonderful music director. We're, we're all on the same page moving forward with that. So it's, it's very exciting times for, for where we're headed. What that's going to look like 10 years from now, I'm not exactly sure, but that's part of the discovery process. You know, when Magellan uh, set out to sail around into the Pacific for the first time, he had no idea what he was going to find. When Columbus came over, he had no idea what he was going to find, and that's why it's called exploration, and that's why we, we, we're out there exploring, um, trying to really find what the next horizon is going to be for classical music. And other types of music as well. One of the things that's impressed me the most is that, oh, you spoke about your cohort in crime. I know your great partnership with the music director of the Florida Orchestra, who's entering his eighth season as principal conductor and music director, Michael Francis, internationally renowned, and a musician himself at the beginning. So I know the two of you share much the same vision and much the same ambition to make the orchestra the Florida Orchestra for all of us. You've always emphasized that I've heard that the orchestra belongs to each and every one of us and you're trying to make it accessible and affordable and attractive and engaging to a very diverse audience. And speaking of that audience, so you've got pops, you've got the classical iconic epic masterworks, you have special film concerts. Oh my gosh, I recently saw you have gaming concerts and cosplay family concerts, youth concerts. You're a busy orchestra. Is it true you've got, what, over 100 concerts coming up in this next season? Well over 100 concerts. And we go from small chamber uh, orchestra stuff, uh, Brandenburg Concerti, uh, 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 things like that, all the way through the Beatles to Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. Uh, you know, films, we're, you know, we're starting the season uh, coming up here in September with uh, a live orchestra playing Amadeus. Oh, that's we, good. It, it's the Live orchestra is nothing new. It's been around for quite a while. Actually, John Williams is one that, that started that. But what better uh, piece than Amadeus, which is about Mozart and is about classical music, uh, to play. And, and uh, so we're really excited to, to have such a wide variety. You know, we're here to make the best possible experience for people regardless of whether it's, it's uh, you know, you're listening to Beethoven or you're listening to Bach or Brahms, or whether you're listening to Led Zeppelin, or, you know, or, or you know, uh, Abbey Road, which we're doing this year. We want to make sure that we are providing the best possible experience for anybody so that we're going to them on their terms rather than them coming to us on our terms. That's well, how we build community. I think that's very important that you're trying to reach the people where they are, not just physically but metaphorically. And I want to get back to that because you take the orchestra outside of the concert halls to serve and build community. But staying within the concert halls for just a little bit longer, you've got some terrific concerts that I don't think anybody wants to miss. You mentioned the full album of Abbey Road that's going to be played in its entirety by the full orchestra and also Aretha. You've got a fantastic vocalist. What some of uh, our audience may not realize is that you bring in guest artists who are vocalists. You're doing two concerts with the Master Chorale. That's over 150 uh, vocalists up on stage with the orchestra. Really, it's just spectacular what you've got planned for the season. Absolutely. We start off with a big bang with Carmina Burana which uh, many people, you know, my first association with Carmina, Carmina Burana was when I was in junior high and Carno, uh, pardon me, Conan the Barbarian came out. <laughs> and that was a soundtrack for, for that, which I just, and then I remember the first time hearing it with the Phoenix Symphony, I was like, wait, I know that song. And of course that has a big chorus and soloists and it's, uh, it's just a, a raucous piece. It's a lot of fun uh, to play, uh, Carl Orff. And then we have, of course, yeah, uh, uh, Michael does such a brilliant job of programming we have Scheherazade and Miraculous Mandarin on mm -hmm. the same thing, it, mm -hmm. and conducted by uh, you know two pieces about women, uh, very powerful women, uh, very influential women, and then of course we have one of the, the leading women conductors in the world, Joanne Folletta, is coming to conduct that. So we're really uh, excited about that piece. And then we shift on to Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony, which everybody loves. As, as I like to say, Tchaikovsky was the uh, greatest Italian uh, composer that we've ever had, even though he was Russian. <laughs> and uh, but we're doing his Fourth Symphony, and then uh, with Jeff. Walter playing um, a concerto that was commissioned uh, for us by Michael Ippolito, another Floridian. So we, you know, it's it's a wide variety of things. Michael has programmed Elijah at the end of the year, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know four soloists, a giant chorus, and just a, a fantastic piece. 
of course, we end the season um, with uh, Wagner's Ring Without Words, which takes uh, 16 hours of opera and puts it into 70 minutes, which is really great for most people. Um, I'm a big fan of Wagner, but uh, you know, 16 hours is a little bit long to sit through. That's like some of the drives that I do when I drive sometimes. And then, of course, we have things, exciting things like the Rite of Spring. Mm -hmm. You know, also on our first concert, you'll hear, hear Daphnis and Chloe, which is a, a fantastic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, fantasy story. There's just a, a wide variety of things that we're doing. Pops-wise, we have Harry Potter versus Star Wars, which will be a comparison of the two. And you're starting to see that come up in, in popular uh, social media stuff now is, you know, hey, you never see Dumbledore next to Yoda or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's that kind of stuff that we're doing. Um, and then, of course, uh, like you had mentioned, uh, Aretha Franklin. And then, you know, we're ending the, starting the year with uh, Broadway and ending the year with the Oscars. Oh, so it's cool. such a, a great book. And, uh, you know, we're so fortunate to have so many talented people work for us to bring what I think is really one of the best uh, products to market, um, all with the idea that we're here to build community. And every one of these concerts that we do, we try and reach people in ways that are meaningful to them so that we can, we can really demonstrate what the, the, the trans transformative power of the orchestra. Well, you know, music does a lot of things to the brain, to the soul, to the emotions. It's not just sitting in the concert hall. You also have some you, very robust program, I understand, of education and community engagement. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So I'm the poster child for why we need to have music education because if I was, if it wasn't for music, I would either be in a ditch or digging a ditch. <laughs> um, uh, but it really is, is a way, um, I always like to tell people when we talk about why music education is important, find me a three-year-old, a four-year-old, or a five-year-old that's not jumping around, dancing around, and singing. You know, find a, a, little, a, a little kid that doesn't uh, that doesn't do that. I think it was Einstein that said, you know, every child is a, is a uh, artistic genius. We just spend our entire life beating that out of them. And uh, you know, same thing with art. Name a kid that you give a box of color crayon and pencils to, and they can't, or a, a, a paper, and they can't figure out what to do with it. So music education is is important though, because for a lot of kids, it gives them um, an outlet to help um, really help manage their emotions. You got to remember is these little kids are growing up every day they wake up with a different body because they're growing and music allows them to have the ability to manage those emotions it teaches them how to do it and also i can tell you from also being a furniture maker music also will teach you how to read a ruler like no one unless you use metric and then I, that my analogy falls apart because music is basically the ruler just divided up how you divide it up in different ways and that's why when i spend time in the shop and i have to divide um, uh, you know, really odd fractions, you know, there's a dodge to do that that we've learned, but, but I learned that through music. Music, uh, cognitively, um, to, to play one single note on an instrument takes 27 different functions to come together at one mm. time. And so every time kids learn to pull, pull these, mu these you know, notes together into phrases and then into pieces, the amount of computing power that has to go into that is just ridiculously phenomenal. But it also stimulates them emotionally. Um, and so music is a very well-rounded. It's both left brain and right brain. Mm -hmm. I love to have that argument with people say, no, it's only right brain. And I'm like, oh, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Because when you're sitting there playing, whether you're a, a student for the first time or you are, uh, you know, you've been playing for 30 years, your brain is analyzing. The left brain is going to town on what's going, what's, what's happening, what's going on, and your right brain is creating, and they have that dialogue that crosses both sides. Well, I've been very impressed by something that I heard you say uh, when you were addressing an audience. I think it was the World Affairs Conference or some important body uh, uh, of a uh, grouping of people, and you were saying about how an orchestra is really all about creative problem solving, that every mm -hmm. minute that you're there, you're anticipating your end we'll just veer off for one quick moment because you know all about uh, creative problem solving uh, in the air. You mm. flew as a commercial airline pilot, I understand, for nearly a decade, uh, the shuttle between Boston and LaGuardia, was it? Correct. Yes, and so tell us a little bit about how that has influenced the way that you see the leadership uh, characteristics that come into play with your role. So 
as a musician, like you said, we're, we're problem solving. From the minute we sit down in a practice room or on stage, it is solve the problem. What do we have to do? Okay, I have to play this phrase. How am I going to do that? What do I have? What techniques do I have to use? Whatever you know. What you know? I want to make this a certain you know uh, emotional statement with it. What do I have to do? Um, surprisingly enough, uh, musicians make great pilots. They also make great lit litigation lawyers because. And people always ask me, well, how is that the same? When we're on stage playing as a musician, we are always two or three steps ahead of the music, but yet we're also reacting to what's happening around with our colleagues immediately around us. When you are flying an airplane, you are doing exactly the same thing. As a, you know, first learning to fly as a pilot, you know, one of the things your instructors tell you or I would tell my students is you must be ahead of the airplane. You can't let the airplane fly you, you have to fly the airplane. But you also have to react to what's happening, and being an airline pilot was exactly the same way. The difference is, is if you screw up <laughs> Uh, as, a, as, a, as a musician, I just make the viola players or the cello players mad because they sit in front of me. Uh, you do that in an airplane, of course, you make the, you make the news and you're in a lawn ornament <laughs> somewhere in New Jersey. So, uh, uh, but it is the same skill set. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, uh, I've, I've learned also that there are times when things are going horribly wrong in the air uh, that you can't quit. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, mm -hmm. you, you have an option to crash or to mm -hmm. solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And to be able to think on your feet and not get encumbered, uh, I think that's where music was so uh, uh, powerful in, you know, in helping me in leadership you know, ad adjust and adapt. And I know uh, Michael Francis and I, that's how we got through COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we both sit in the same side of the orchestra, him being a b bass player, me being a bass trombone player. So we had a lot of time to think because we don't play as much as the violins do, uh, which is probably why we're not nearly as neurotic as a lot of other musicians that play high notes are, because we don't have that many to play. Uh, no, I'm just all, all joking aside, but we do sit there and we have a lot of time, um, you know, while we're playing. Uh, and, and I think we, you start to put that creative side together into mm -hmm. problem solving. And because of that ability to pivot and adapt, um, that's how we got through COVID. Well, and that's how you're helping these third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in Title I and trauma response Absolutely. schools in Pinellas County and elsewhere. I know you're in the second year of a memorandum of understanding with Pinellas County, and you're providing this amazing music education instrument instruction, but really transferable life skills that you're paving a way for a totally different future for these students through music. What we're seeing with these kids in some of these really tough schools, what we're seeing uh, is the teachers are saying from the start of the year, these kids would go to, you know, from zero to 100, you know, somebody bumps them and they're just like, you know, how dare you do that? And, and it's, it's almost an instant combativeness. And what we're seeing now is because there is an aspect of team playing when you play music, you're playing together, mm -hmm. um, but there's a communication that has to happen that is not uh, verbal communication like we're doing. It is a, a, a much more emotional communication. And because of that, and because these kids are exposed to it and they're learning about it and they're learning a skill at the same time, they're now solving their own problems. So it's, it's an indirect way of the problem solving that we have to learn to play the instruments that comes into regular life. And, and we're seeing, and, and the teachers are saying now these students are doing much better in their classes. They're, they've become leaders within their class. And we're talking, you know, second, third graders. We're not talking, you know, mm -hmm. high schoolers. But these kids are now naturally becoming leaders and they're moving in a direction that is, is going to hopefully have a, a very positive impact in their life. Our responsibility as an orchestra is to make sure that these kids have opportunities and access uh, from now until they become adults. Well, what a wonderful way to uh, begin your 55th season, knowing that you're bringing as a nonprofit organization, which the Florida Orchestra is, that you're bringing such impactful, transformative programs into the community and into underserved areas, at-risk youth, and where it's most needed. Back to the concert hall, you have a new assistant conductor. She is female. This is a rarity uh, in the orchestra world. She is young. She's absolutely beautiful. I've had the fortune to meet her. And she's going to be conducting, speaking of youth, all of your youth concerts. I think she's got 26 concerts coming up in this season. Her name is Chelsea Gallo, and uh, hopefully we'll have her on the show at a future. Mark, any last words for the season? What are you most excited about? What are you most looking forward to? And what's the next 55 years of the Florida Orchestra? What I'm most excited about is being able to get back in the concert hall to whatever the new normal is. Um, we are about live music and about the experience that you cannot get at home. We learned this during COVID. 
there's nothing like sitting in a concert hall with 2,000 other people in that shared experience of sharing, you know, joy, happiness, sorrow. Um, music brings something completely different to everybody, but it's that, that, that shared sense of uh, being together and being united. Uh, with the exception of the Rite of Spring, I can't really think of any other time, in, especially in classical music, where there was ever any kind of uh, violence, and the Rite of Spring only was a bloody nose. Uh, but that's what we do. So I'm really looking forward to, to getting back into the concert hall, but not to do what, just what we've always done, but to continue the journey of exploring what's next, what's around the next corner. Mark, one of the things that I've always been very curious about is the music is the universal language. And here we are in the experience economy. And how do you take a group of, there's what, nearly 70 musicians, uh, one conductor, and sometimes there's a guest artist, sometimes there's a guest conductor. How do you make it into a cohesive, as you say, product that is this world class, because the orchestra is world class. You've traveled all over the world as a musician, as an arts leader. I've been all over the world and lived in many places around the world. And I can tell you that so proud that the Tampa Bay area, and really we're Florida's orchestra, has this world class orchestra. How do you bring it all together? How does it come? How does it happen? There's four things that happen in a concert experience, um, and this is what makes orchestra, uh, orchestras in particular, even more than a rock band or any other live music that makes it so, so special. And we always have to keep in mind uh, that these four things have to happen uh, in the environment. And Michael and I talk about this all the time. Um, the first is uh, the well-known um, uh, communication because in essence that's what we're doing as musicians. We're communicating just in a nonverbal way or of course with opera in a verbal way. Uh, but it's always about the power of the music and, and, and so the, the conductor communicating with the musicians. It's nonverbal, uh, well, at least we hope so in the concert hall because during a concert if, some, if, the commu if the conductor's talking something's gone horribly wrong. Uh, but assuming that everything's gone right, uh, there's communication, a uh, very complex communication that has to happen. Um, and then there's also, uh, and, and of course, you know, all the corporate world just jumps all over that kind of communication, the mm -hmm. team building, because that's in essence that's what it's about, mm -hmm. team building. And then the uh, communication also that happens amongst uh, musicians, it's what we call radar. And again, you have even less ability than a conductor does to conduct because usually you're looking forward and you can't necessarily see too well what's happening, but you figure out a way of just to play together. I mean, because you do not need a conductor for everything, because there's a lot of chamber music that happens where people play without somebody you know, being a conductor. Um, and then there's the uh, next step, which is the communication that happens between the stage and the audience. Mm. And each one of these becomes more important but more subtle. And then, there, of course, after that, con that uh, communication, there's a communication that has to happen that amongst the audience members themselves. And when those four things click and go, you have an absolutely electric concert experience. Mm, and that's true. I've it, sat in the concert hall and felt it. You can actually, it's yeah. palpable, right? And, and that's why I'm a big fan of always having full concert halls, because when you have full concert halls, that changes the environment. And everybody wants to be there, and it's just very much more exciting. But that communication is key, and this is what young kids learn in music when they're learning is with that uh, communication, and people are like, well, how, how does this happen? And, you know, I don't see how that can, especially people who don't, who unfortunately didn't have any, any musical background or training. I, I feel very uh, uh, sorry for them, and I always tell them, as an adult, it's never too late. But having spent all those years on the back of, of, of a dog team with sled dogs in the middle of nowhere, I can tell you, you can learn to communicate without any words. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you learn, you know, when you're 100 miles out in the middle of nowhere and it's 30 below zero and you're trying to figure out, you know, how your team's doing or whatever, you learn very quickly, you know, h how each individual dog is doing. And there's no communication that you have available. That, that played very heavily in learning as a musician and then also uh, as a manager how that works. All I do is, as the CEO of the orchestra is I try and manage a relationship between what happens on stage and our audience. Mm. And when I do a great job of that, people come out of there with bright, shining eyes and smiles. And, and that's, you know, I always go around afterwards looking at people's faces to see how they're doing. And, and, and Michael does the same thing. He's up on stage and when he's talking to people between pieces, he's looking to see that. And when you see those bright, shining eyes out there, you know you're doing the right thing. Well, and it takes a lot to pull this all together. I was stunned, shocked, in fact, to learn that it costs nearly a million dollars a month, nearly a million dollars a month to rent, because you're 
I call it the ultimate homeless. Yeah. You play in all of these halls uh, up in Clearwater and Tampa and St. Petersburg, travel from hall to hall. I don't think people realize how many times a week rehearsals, then the concerts themselves, all of those are very expensive rentals and you have to move everything. It's quite the production, backstage, things that we don't even see or think about. And so I know you're also very uh, keen to get people into the concert halls at all levels. You don't want there to be any socioeconomic or other barriers to people enjoying and experiencing the wonder that is live music. And so how do you balance keeping Ticket prices, very affordable. If you go to New York or any other big city, they're outrageously sky high. That's not the case with the Florida Orchestra. Very affordable. You give a lot of comp tickets to youth groups, students. Those are free. You uh, give redu reduced tickets to first responders, military, veterans. My goodness, how do you do it? You, you, you said something that's key. It's about eliminating barriers. Um, there are so many perceptions about classical music, um, about what it is, who it's for, and those perceptions are all wrong. Uh, we are, at the end of the day, uh, composers write music, and uh, as musicians we perform music because we want to change people's lives. So we're able to keep ticket prices low because we have uh, an amazing donor base, and people give very generously. And we have some great partners in our venues that also try and help keep rent as low as they can while still maintaining their business model. But our ultimate goal when we do this, when we look at this and we look at ticket pricing and we look at getting people in there, our ultimate goal is to break down all of the barriers so that our music is for everyone. It's not just for an elite set group. That's why we have the variety of programming that we have. That's why we do what we do. We play movies, we play rock shows, we play you know, uh, st you know, Star Wars, we play you know, Harry Potter, we play Beethoven, we play Brahms. Our goal is to make, uh, make what we do as accessible without barriers. If you have a problem, I always tell this to people uh, like in, in the box office, if uh, we have a special that we're running and somebody comes in and they, they can't really prove that they, they meet the criteria for it, if those people are that desperate to come to one of our concerts, those are the people we want in the concert hall. Our goal is not to tell people no. Our goal is to find a way to say yes and bring people into the concert. Well, I appreciate that inclusivity. You carry that forward in your staff. You have African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans, lots of women. Uh, it's very admirable. Same thing if you look at the complexity, uh, and I know that they are uh, competitively auditioned, uh, but you also have a very nice mix within the musicians themselves, LGBTQ, everything. And you see that more and more in the audiences. I was really pleasantly surprised that throughout this whole last season, there's every, lots of Spanish. I've never been so comfortable. <laughs> Somebody even came up to me and started speaking Chinese. So you are attracting a broader and broader audience. And that goes, I think, hand in hand with the growth, the explosive growth of the Tampa Bay area. It's being driven a lot by the new entrepreneurs and tech companies. And I think that the orchestra for 55 years has been a driving force and a leader in that growth. And so I'm very pleased to hear you say that the community is getting behind the orchestra and continuing to support it to move forward together. And you've said this before, you're big on collaborations. You do a lot with other nonprofits. I don't think I've ever seen a nonprofit organization that has as many collaborations and as productive ones as, as the Florida Orchestra. And so tell us a little bit about moving forward together, how you see the community building community together. So Tampa Bay, the reason I came here uh, in 2018, four years ago is when I first found out about this job. Uh, I had a, a recruiter call me and say, hey, would you be interested in this? And I'm like, Florida, are you out of your mind? We used to come down here with the Boston Pops on tour all the time. And I'm like, there's no way. I'm not, why would I move to Florida? I'm like, well, all right, I'll look into it. Because it was sleepy town, St. Petersburg, when you came with the Boston was, Pops. 98 was when I remember coming through here, and downtown St. Petersburg was a very, and even Tampa was very different. It mm -hmm. was not what it is today. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I very quickly um, came to realize that this place has the pieces together for what has motivated me, and probably the reason why I, I've been on my career path to change from being a musician to, you know, a pilot, which was just kind of a, a a side thing, and I, you know, if it wasn't for uh, the Boston Philharmonic, uh, I would probably be still be flying airplanes, but they had a specific need. But anyway, 
what we have here is, is all of the pieces to a puzzle to assemble what I like to say is the Paris of the 1890s or 1900s, the cultural center of the world, mm -hmm. not just of Florida. We already are. Uh, I know there's other cities that will hate to hear, my, hear me say that. My friend up in uh, Jacksonville may argue with me with that, but, but I honestly believe it. We have the ability, we already are, I think, the cultural hub of Florida. Um, uh, we have the ability to, to be the cultural hub of the world. All of the pieces are, are here. We have people moving in here by the droves. We have, uh, you know, large companies, very wealthy, very uh, affluent companies moving in here, uh, just left and right. We have the ability to build that that Paris. However, it won't be the same as Paris was back back then. The difference being that it's going to take an entire uh, group of people with a similar and dissimilar interests to assemble that puzzle. I can't do it up by myself. It's going to, it needs a lot of people, very smart people, which we have, to sit down and say, we want to create the, great, the greatest society, the greatest civilization in Florida. And so through those collaborations, like and unlike, that is how we will do it. By putting together that team of people who share the same vision, the same goal, we can create something special that's a once in a hundred years um, that you see, like Paris, or now for this century, it will be here in Tampa Bay. Well, that is a very exciting and ambitious vision. I think that the Tampa Bay area and indeed the state of Florida is very fortunate to have you, Mark. I'm glad they extended your contract. I'm glad you've got the musicians happy with their collective bargaining agreement. And I'm especially proud that we've got 55 years of the Florida Orchestra as one of the leading arts organizations and leaders in our community, as you say. We exist to build community. We look forward to the next 55 years and to your leadership for the first part of that at least. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Susanna Weymouth, and this is Tampa Bay Community Network Culture Ventures.